Okay, we're continuing demand and supply. Uh, this is part two of the demand and supply series. Uh, in part one, we introduced the idea of markets, demand and supply, why this is going to be so useful, and then we spent a lot of time starting to think about what is meant by demand, quantity demanded, demand schedule, and probably most importantly, the demand curve and what affects the demand curve. Uh, well, the demand curve, you know, and demand, that, that you would usually think of that as the consumers, the people who are doing the buying, the demanding. Now we shift to look at the supply, who is doing the selling of the products. Uh, we start by talking about quantity supplied, right? The quantity supplied, similar to the idea of the quantity demanded, it's the number of units. Now, though, it's the sellers want to sell over some specified period of time at a given price. So you'd name a price to the seller, they would tell you how many units they'd be willing to sell, that gives you a quantity supplied. You can construct what's called a supply schedule, which is similar to the demand schedule, only now we're dealing with suppliers. Uh, you do that by giving a number of different prices and finding out what the quantity supplied is at each price. And you could convert that into a supply curve which is just a graphical representation of the supply schedule. Then um, ceteris paribus is the assumption all else held equal. We do that assumption a lot. We kind of we assume everything else is held constant. What is the analysis when you see a change? Um, so the quantity supplied at each price, holding everything else constant, so the supply schedule. So the ceteris paribus, we actually usually don't even state it, but it is implied in most of our analysis that everything else is indeed held constant. So the supply schedule, it's a table or a chart that shows the relationship between the price of a product and the quantity that's supplied. So now let's look at how many lattes would Starbucks sell at any given price, right? That tells us the supply curve. So what, looking at this, um, at a price of zero, how many would Starbucks want to sell or how many would anybody want to sell, right? The answer is clearly zero, right? Firms aren't in this to give things away. Firms want to make money. Uh, so at a price of zero, the firm won't provide any. Uh, price of a dollar, you might see that they're willing to provide a few lattes. Two dollars, they're willing to provide a few more. Um, as the price goes up, Starbucks is willing to supply more and more lattes, right? They might even hire an extra worker if they have to hire an extra worker or two, even if it's a little bit more expensive. Um, to hire extra workers or pay for overtime, they might be willing to do more as the price keeps going up and up and up for a latte. So as the price increased, you see they'd supply more. And intuitively, I think that should make sense, right? The price goes up, there's more of an incentive for any company to sell more of a product. So this is Starbucks supply of lattes. Now, much like what we did with the demand curve, we could look at the supply schedule and put it into a supply curve. And you should be doing this in your notes. So the supply curve, what do we, with demand and supply curves, the first thing we say when you plot the axes out, quantity goes on the x-axis. That's you label the x-axis with the Q. Price goes on the y-axis, label that with the P. And then look at the coordinates, right? Price goes zero to six dollars. Quantity goes zero to 18. Let's see, we stop at 15, but then 16, 17, 18. Yeah, there's space on this graph. That's the starting work, and then you start plotting the points. Okay. Price of zero, zero is supplied. Okay, that's an easy enough point to plot. At a price of a dollar, three lattes would be supplied. Price of $2, six lattes would be supplied. $3, nine lattes would be supplied. You know, and it keeps going up. At $4, 12, $5, 15, and $6, 18. So we have several points on our graph. Connect them together with a line. Uh, label it with an S, right? S for supply. I'd, I'd, I usually would put it right up about here somewhere. So label it with an S. And you've just plotted the supply curve. So the supply curve, uh, one thing to note, 
and what we'll say here is uh, the law of supply, right? We had a law of demand. Law of demand, if you recall, said as the price increases, consumers would buy fewer, or the quantity demanded will drop. Or if the price decreases, the quantity demanded would increase. And that was our law of demand. Well, law, what does the law of supply say? The law of supply says that if you increase the price, producers would be willing to sell more. And that, that should intuitively make sense, right? If you provide a greater financial incentive, the firm's producers will do whatever they can to sell more to get that extra money. On a greater price, they're willing to sell more. So the law of supply says that as the price producers can make increases, the quantity supplied increases as well. Should seem straightforward. Um, it's just that extra incentive to make more money. You do whatever you can to sell more units when the price increases. So we make an assumption about the supply curve um, that the producer has control over the quantity they can sell, but price is fixed outside of the producer's control. Now this assumption might seem a little bit odd when you first read it because you might be used to firms trying to set the price. But really where this comes down to is it comes right back to the assumption we made when we're thinking about the quantity supplied and the supply schedule. We weren't really looking at how much they are selling. The supply curve looks at if the price is a dollar, how many would you sell? If the price is two dollars, how many would you sell? If the price is three dollars, how many would you sell? And so on. Uh, we, we assume that that price can't be adjusted. Uh, you may be familiar with stores, and when you walk into a store, they list a price. Uh, however, the reason we go with this assumption, there's, there's two reasons. One, we almost have to, right, in order just to make our model work, and we've mentioned sometimes models make some assumptions that might not be realistic. Um, so technically we just kind of have to do it to get our models to work and it really doesn't negatively affect anything. But in markets that are quite competitive actually this assumption is probably pretty valid. And the reason it's valid is producers want to try, would love to try to adjust the price they could charge but they probably don't have that much control to do it because since markets are competitive, consumers could go elsewhere. And in fact, if a market's perfectly competitive, the producers really don't have any control over that. So the supply curve assumes that the price is fixed outside of the producer's control or price is exogenous, which means if the price changes, you simply move to a different point on the supply curve, right? If the price changes, let's say it goes from $2 to $4, you don't go to a new supply curve. Your supply curve has all the information you need to handle a price change. If the price goes from $2 to $4, the quantity supplied goes from 6 up to 12 right? That results in what you'd call a movement along the supply curve. So a change in price results in a movement along the supply curve. Uh, related to what we said for demand, if it's only the price changing, we would not say the supply curve itself is changing. In order for the supply curve to change, um, something other than price has to affect supply. Then the supply curve would shift either to the left, which would represent a decrease in supply, or to the right, which represents an increase in supply. <clears throat> so if something other than price affects supply, then the supply curve shifts one way or the other, to the left or to the right. There are a number of factors that can shift the supply curve. So the number of sellers is the natural one. The more sellers, supply curve shifts to the right, which is an increase. Technology, technology improves. Usually firms can sell things for less, shift to the right. Resource prices, um, taxes and subsidies, expectations, prices of other goods and services, uh, nature. Um, Nature could just be something unexpected or it could actually be weather, right? If a hurricane goes through, it could knock out some suppliers, right? Uh, if a hurricane hits or, uh, Florida, it might wipe out a lot of the orange crop. Well, that decreases the supply of oranges, right? This is going to have an effect on the market. And with our demand and supply curve, we're actually going to be able to say quite a bit about what do we expect if a hurricane hits Florida and destroys some of the orange crop. 
right? This is one of the things that could shift the supply curve. So if you have an increase in supply, what you'll see is a shift to the right. So going through this example, you know, this is continuing with the latte example. In this particular example, at each price, there's five, a quantity, five more are supplied. So at a dollar, instead of five being supplied, 10 are supplied. Two dollars, instead of 10 being supplied, 15 are supplied, and so on. We have an entire new supply curve. The, the whole supply curve has shifted, and it's shifted to the right. Now, I want you to be very cautious, and you probably should note this in your notes, um, even though it's not coming up on one of the slides. When we talk about supply changes, you will not want to say the supply goes up or down. The reason for this, this graph shows an increase in supply. But if you look at it, you might almost think that supply drops, right? Just if you kind of look at the graph the right way, it looks like the supply curve is falling. But this is an increase in supply. At any given price, firms are willing to sell more. So I would, you don't want to talk about the supply curve dropping or you know, fall, you know, going up or down. You'd like to talk about it shifting to the right or to the left, just to keep things straight. When the supply increases, the supply curve shifts to the right, like we see this. If it decreases, right? And we mentioned the example, of what happens if a hurricane wipes out some of the orange crop? You'll just see the opposite example. You'd see a curve that shifted to the left. The entire curve just shifts over. So there are a number of things that can shift the supply curve, just like there's a number of things that can shift the demand curve. 